The Bible explains that the bloodline story began with Adam and Eve, from whose third son, Seth, evolved a line which progressed through Methuselah and Noah, eventually to Abraham, who became the great patriarch of the Hebrew nation. It then relates that Abraham brought his family westwards out of Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan, from where some of his descendants moved into Egypt. After a few generations, they moved back into Canaan where, in time, the eventual David of Bethlehem became king of the newly defined kingdom of Israel. The problem with such distant history is that the earliest Hebrew scriptures were compiled between the 6th and 1st centuries BCE. They are not likely, therefore, to be that authentic in relating accuracies from thousands of years before. Indeed, this is plainly the case because their express purpose was to convey an account which upheld the principles of the Jewish faith, a faith that did not emerge until well into the ancestral history. Given that the scriptural books were commenced while the Israelites were held captive in Mesopotamian Babylon from 586 BCE, it is apparent that Babylon was where the original records were then held. In fact, from the time of Adam, through some 19 said generations down to Abraham, the whole of the Old Testament patriarchal history was Mesopotamian. More specifically, the history was from southern Mesopotamia, where the ancient Sumerians did indeed refer to the grasslands of the Euphrates Delta as the Eden. It is also apparent that certain books were, for some reason, not selected for inclusion in the canonical Old Testament. The books of Enoch and Jubilees, for example. A further book to which attention is specifically drawn in the books of Joshua and Samuel is the book of Jasher. But despite its apparent importance to the Hebrew writers, it was excluded from final selection. Similarly, the book of Numbers draws out attention to the books of the Wars of Jehovah, and in the book of Isaiah we are directed towards the book of the Lord. What were these books? Where are these books? They are all mentioned in the Bible, which means they all predate the Old Testament, so why did the editors dismiss them when the selection was made? In pursuing an answer to this question, a fact which becomes increasingly clear is that in English language Bibles, the definition of Lord is used in a general context. But in earlier texts, a positive distinction is drawn between Jehovah and the Lord. It has often been wondered why the biblical God of the Hebrews led them through trials and tribulations, floods and disaster when, from time to time, he appears to have performed with a quite contrary and merciful personality. The answer is that although now seemingly embraced as the one God by the Jewish and Christian faiths, there was originally a distinct difference between the figures of Jehovah and the Lord. They were, in fact, quite separate deities. The God referred to as Jehovah was traditionally a storm god, a god of wrath and vengeance whereas the God referred to as the Lord was a God of fertility and wisdom. The name given to the Lord in the early writings was Adon, the prevailing Semitic word for Lord. As for the apparent personal name of Jehovah, this was not used in the early days, and the Vulgate Bible explains that the God of Abraham was called El Shaddai, which relates to the Great One of the Mountain. The identity of Jehovah, Yahweh, came from the original Hebrew stem YHWH, which, according to Exodus, meant, I am that I am. This was said to be a statement made by God to Moses on Mount Sinai hundreds of years after the time of Abraham. Jehovah was therefore not a name at all, and early texts refer simply to El Shaddai, with his opposing counterpart being Adon. To the Canaanites, these gods were respectively called El Elyon and Baal. In modern Bibles, the definitions God and Lord are used and intermixed throughout as if they were one and the same character, but originally they were not. One was a vengeful god, a people suppressor. The other was a social god, a people supporter. And they each had wives, sons, and daughters. The old writings tell us that throughout the patriarchal era, 
The Israelites endeavored to support Adon the Lord, but at every turn El Shaddai, aka the storm god Jehovah, retaliated with floods, tempest, famines, and destruction. Even at the very end, around 600 BCE, the Bible explains that Jerusalem was overthrown at Jehovah's bidding. Tens of thousands of Israelites were taken into Babylonian captivity simply because one of their previous kings had erected altars in veneration of Baal, the Adon. It was during the course of this captivity that the Israelites finally succumbed to the Jehovah God of wrath. They developed a new religion out of sheer fear of his retribution. And this was only 500 years before the time of Jesus. Subsequently, the Christians took Jehovah on board as well, calling him simply God, while the hitherto social concepts of the Adon were totally discarded. The two religions were henceforth both faiths of fear. This leaves us knowing that, within an overall pantheon of gods and goddesses, many of whom are actually named in the Bible, there were two predominant and opposing deities. In different cultures, the pair have been called El Elyon and Baal, El Shaddai and Adon, Ariman and Mazda, Jehovah and Lord, God and Father. But these styles are titular. They are not personal names. So who precisely were they? To find the answer, we have to look no further than where these gods were operative, An old Canaanite text discovered in Syria in the 1920s tell us that their courts were in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley in Mesopotamia. We can trace the related Sumerian records back to about 3700 BCE, and they relate that the gods in question were brothers. In Sumer, the storm god, who eventually became known as Jehovah, was called Enlil, and his brother, who became Adon the Lord, was called Enki. The text inform us that it was Enlil who brought the flood, it was Enlil who destroyed Ur in Babylon, it was Enlil who constantly opposed the education and enlightenment of humankind. Indeed, Syrian text tells us that it was Enlil who obliterated the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah on the Dead Sea, not because they were dens of wickedness, but because they were great centers of wisdom and learning. It was the Lord Enki, on the other hand, who, despite the wrath of his brother, granted the Sumerians access to the Tree of Knowledge and the Tree of Life. It was Enki who set up the escape strategy during the flood, and it was Enki who passed over the time-honored tables of destiny, the tablets of scientific law which became the bedrock of the early mystery schools in Egypt. The kings of the early succession, who reigned in Sumer and Egypt before becoming kings in Israel, were anointed upon installation with the fat of the sacred crocodile. This noble beast was referred to as the mushus, or mesa, from which derived the Hebrew verb to anoint, and the kings of this dynastic succession were referred to as messiahs, meaning anointed ones. The first king of the messianic succession, was the biblical Cain, head of the Sumerian house of Kish. On recognizing this, one can immediately see an early anomaly in the traditional Genesis story, for the historical line to David and Jesus was not from Adam and Eve's son Seth at all. It descended from Eve's son Cain. Conventional teaching generally cites Cain as being the first son of Adam and Eve, but he was not. Even the book of Genesis tells us that he was not. In fact, it confirms how Eve told Adam that Cain's father was the Lord, who was, of course, Enki. Even outside the Bible, the writings of the Hebrew Talmud and Midrash make it quite plain that although Cain was Eve's eldest son, he was not the son of Adam. The Old Testament book of Genesis, in its translated form, tells us that Cain was a tiller of the ground, but this is not what the original text relates. What it states is that Cain had dominion over the earth, which is a rather different matter when considering his kingly status. The Bible translators appear to have had a constant problem with the word earth, often translating it to ground, clay, or dust, instead of recognizing it as relating to the earth. 
Even in the case of Adam and Eve, the translators made glaring errors. The Bible says, Male and female created he them, and he called their name Adam. Older writings used the more complete word Adama, which means of the earth. However, this did not mean they were made of dirt. It means that they were earthlings. Adam and Eve, known then as Ataba and Kaba, and jointly called the Adama, were purpose-bred for kingship by Enki and his sister wife Ninhurzag. This took place at a creation chamber which the Sumerian annals refer to as the house of Shiempti, meaning breath, wind, or life. Adam and Eve were certainly not the first people on earth, but they were the first of the genetically contrived kingly succession. The records tell that Ninhurzag was called the Lady of the Embryo or the Lady of Life, and she was the surrogate mother for the Ataba and Kaba who were created from human ova fertilized by the Lord Enki. It was because of Ninhurzag's title, Ninti, meaning Lady of Life, that Kaba was later given the same distinction by the Hebrews. Indeed, the name Kaba, or Abba or Eve, was subsequently said to mean life. As you may already know, both Enki and Ninhurzag, along with their brother Enlil, belong to a pantheon of gods and goddesses referred to as the Anunnaki. In fact, the Grand Assembly of the Anunnaki, later called the Court of the Elohim, is actually mentioned in the Old Testament's Psalm number 82, wherein Jehovah makes his bid for supreme power over the other gods. According to tradition, the importance of Cain was that he was directly produced by Enki and Eve, so his bloodline was three-quarters Anunnaki. While his half-brothers Abel and Seth were less than half Anunnaki, being the offspring of Adam and Eve. Cain's Anunnaki blood was so advanced that it was said that his brother Abel's blood was earthbound by comparison. It was related in the scriptures that Cain rose far above Abel, so that his brother's blood was swallowed into the ground, but this original description was thoroughly misinterpreted for the modern Bible, which now claims that Cain rose up against Abel and spilled his blood upon the ground. This is not the same thing at all. The story can now be progressed by considering the oldest grant of arms in sovereign history, an entitlement which denoted the messianic bloodline for all time. The Sumerians referred to this insignia as representative of the Graal, the nectar of supreme excellence, but biblical history refers to it as the mark of Cain. This mark is portrayed by the modern church as if it were some form of curse, but it is not defined as such in the Bible. Genesis actually relates that, having got into an argument with Jehovah over a matter of sovereign observance, Cain feared for his life. Consequently, the Lord placed a mark upon Cain, swearing sevenfold vengeance against his enemies. It has never been fully understood why Jehovah should decide to protect Cain with this mark when it was he who held the grievance against him. But the fact is that Jehovah did not make this decision. The mark was settled upon Cain by the Lord, and the Lord, the Adon, was not Jehovah also known as Enlil, but it was Cain's own father, Enki. Few people ever think to inquire about the supposed enemies of Cain as defined in Genesis. Who could they possibly have been? Where would they have come from? According to the Bible, only Adam and Eve, along with Cain and Abel, existed, and Cain had apparently killed Abel. Therefore, if one accepts the text as it stands, there was no one around to be Cain's enemy. Another anomaly is presented soon afterwards in Genesis when we are told that Cain found himself a wife. Who on earth were her parents if Adam and Eve were the only people alive? Then, without confronting this anomaly at all, Genesis lists the names of Cain's descendants. It becomes clear from all this that some very important information has been edited from the Old Testament narrative. Plainly, there were plenty of other people around at the time, and it is not difficult to find their stories outside of the Bible. 
In order to further enhance this historical succession from Cain, he was married to his half-sister, a purebred Anunnaki called Lulua. Her father was Inki and her mother was Lilith, a granddaughter of Enlil. Although not giving the name of Cain's wife, the Bible does name their younger son Enoch, while the Sumerian records cite his elder son and kingly successor Atun who is perhaps better known as King Etana of Kish. Etana was said to have walked with the gods and was fed from the plant of birth, the tree of life as it was called in Genesis. Henceforth, the kings of the line were designated as being the twigs of the tree, and the ancient word for twig was klon, or clone. In later times, this plant or tree was redefined as a vine, and so the Graal, the vine, and the messianic bloodline became entwined in the Holy Grail literature of subsequent ages. By virtue of their contrived breeding, this kingly succession was modeled specifically for leadership and in all aspects of knowledge, culture, awareness, wisdom, and intuition, they were highly advanced against their mundane contemporaries. In order to keep their blood as pure as possible, they always married within a close kinship for it was fully recognized that the prominent gene of the succession was carried within the blood of the mother. Today we call this the mitochondrial DNA. And so was born a tradition inherited by their kingly descendants in Egypt and by the later Celtic rulers of Europe. True kingship, it was maintained, was transferred through the female and kingly marriages were therefore strategically cemented with maternal half-sisters and matrilinear first cousins. Having reached the point where the plant of birth is first mentioned in the records, we are at about 3800 BCE, and it is at this stage that we began to learn how the kingly succession was orally fed with bodily supplements from the early days. The supplement in question was a menstrual extract from Inki's sister wife Ninherzag, the designated Lady of Life. It was revered as a sacred Anunnaki essence, defined as the most potent of all life forces and venerated as starfire. In later times, specifically designed cups were used for this ceremony, an example of which now resides at the British Museum. Indeed, it was from this very custom that the eventual chalice and wine tradition, representing the blood of the messianic vine, moved into Christian ritual to become the Eucharist, or the Holy Communion Sacrament. And so, the Canaanite kings of Mesopotamia, while already being of high Anunnaki substance, were fed with Anunnaki starfire to increase their perception, awareness, and intuition. Consequently, they became masters of knowingness, almost like gods themselves. At the same time, their stamina levels and immune systems were dramatically strengthened so that the anti-aging properties of the regularly ingested hormonal secretions facilitated extraordinary lifespans. The practice came to an abrupt halt, however, in about 1960 BCE, precisely when the Bible tells us that Abraham and his family moved northward from Ur to Haran in the kingdom of Mari, before turning westward into Canaan. Clay tablets of the era detail that, at that time, everything changed in the hitherto sacred land of Sumer when invaders came in from all sides. They were Akkadians from the north, Amorites from Syria, and Elamites from Persia. The text continues, When they overthrew, when the order they destroyed, then like a deluge all things together consumed, whereunto, O Sumer, did they change thee? The sacred dynasty from the temple they exiled. Contemporary texts relate that Ur was sacked by the king of nearby Elam soon after 2000 BCE, and although the city was rebuilt, the power center moved north to Haran in the kingdom of Mari. But Haran was not just the name of a flourishing city. It was the name of Abraham's brother, the father of Lot. Documents discovered in 1934 also reveal that other cities in Mesopotamia were similarly named in accordance with Abraham's forebears. Cities such as Terah, Abraham's father, Nahor, Terah's father, Sarug, Nahor's father, and Peleg, Sarug's grandfather. 
Apparently, in line with all the Sumerian evidence which supports the kingly line from Cain, these lately discovered reports confirm that the immediate family of Abraham, in the succession after Noah, were also great commissioners of the region in general. Clearly, the patriarchs represented no ordinary family but constituted a very powerful dynasty. But why would such a long-standing heritage of prominence and renown come to an abrupt end and force Abraham out of Mesopotamia into Canaan? It was at that stage of Sumerian history that the original kingly empire fell. But what happened to the Anunnaki, the grand assembly of gods who had established everything? Once more, the text continues. Ur is destroyed. Bitter is its lament. The country's blood now fills its holes like hot bronze in a mold. Bodies dissolve like fat in the sun. Our temple is destroyed. Smoke lies on our cities like a shroud. The gods have abandoned us like migrating birds. At this point, Gardner suspects that the Anunnaki lost the ability to create starfire and thus handed down kingship to mankind. However, Zechariah Sitchin has postulated a completely different reason for the departure of the Anunnaki. According to Sitchin, it was in 2024 BCE that Enlil authorized the use of weapons of terror by Nergal and Ninurta to destroy the errant Canaanite cities. Not much is referenced about the Anunnaki after this time period, but if you would like to review Sitchin's account of what is called the Evil Wind, the archives suggest you watch our presentation by that same name. A link is in the description. When it comes to Gardner's take on this portion of Anunnaki history, there are indeed several contradictions as compared to Sitchin. The most fundamental difference is that Gardner posits a much shorter timeline for the Anunnaki presence on Earth. Despite this contradiction, both researchers have reached very similar conclusions overall about the Anunnaki. Perhaps the most significant is that the figures in the Old Testament known as Jehovah and the Lord were actually two extraterrestrial brothers named Enlil and Enki.